views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Veronica Greeti filling in for Darren Jaime and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, we'll catch up with candidate for Congress District 15 Councilmember Richie Torres. Afterwards, New York just became the second state to ban discrimination on hair. We'll learn more about that new law with Assemblywoman Tremaine Wright and Senator Jamal Bailey. Next, we'll learn more about the Mercy College Physician Assistant Program. And the League of Women Voters join us to discuss their upcoming voter registration training workshop. After that, the Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation presents Bronx Music at Melrose. Stick around to learn more. Then we'll meet the 2019 New York State Mother of the Year and founder of an initiative called Kids Who Bank. So stay tuned. All this and much more is headed your way because we are now officially open. everyone, I'm Veronica Greeti filling in for Darren Jaime and today is Wednesday, July 24th and you are now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network who's open and being broadcasted simultaneously on MNN's channels. You can stay connected to us via Twitter at BronxNet TV and on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Some things have been going on through this week. We'll take you through it with our Bronx updates. The Pelham Parkway community has received a long-awaited dog run in Bronx Park East. Bronxnet correspondent Ashley Tiffany brings us the story. Dozen of dogs from all breeds, big and small, brought their owners out to the grand opening of Dog Park on Pelham Parkway. Ron Moales, local dog owner, says he's thrilled to bring his dog Xena to the park. He says the benefits of having the playground walking distance from his house makes it easier for Xena to play with her friends. In New York, you can't really uh, let them go. I wish we get more and more dog parks, man. We need them. New York City Parks Commissioner Mitchell Silver says they've wanted this park in their neighborhood for five years. Silver says Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. and Council Member Richie Torres provided the funding to bring this vision alive. Now, our furry friends have a safe and fun place to play this summer. Reporting for BronxNet, Ashley Tiffany. Thank you, Ashley. We'll catch up with Councilmember Richie Torres, who provided funds for the dog run later on. In other news, Councilmember Andy Keene announced an enhancement and renewal project coming to Baychester's Huffin Park. Bronson correspondent Arlene Mokoko has the story. 20 years of a park not being touched, um, you know, it's, it's dated. It's a New York City park named after the Bronx's first borough president, Lewis Haven, that today is about to undergo a massive renovation. Well, there, there, there are schematics already laid out. New York City Council Member Andy King here at the annual Olinville Old Timers Day celebration held at the renovated St. Agnes Haywood Park on Barnes Avenue talked about the new changes coming to Haven, which is over nine acres of parkland located in the Baychester section. The amphitheater is going to be upgraded, the, all the toys, the, the place space is going to be changed, new stuff for, for the plays. The basketball courts we just paid and put new baskets on last summer, so we're not going to really transfer that. We're going to transform the housing station because it is the hub of parks in the Bronx and make sure there's enough staff to handle it, put a new field down. It, when they finish, it's going to be a state-of-the-art 2021 playground park in this Bronx. Also celebrating with him, Bronx Commissioner Iris Rodriguez Rosa. She was excited, came to tears, and I'm glad with the Commissioner Silver, who committed another four million, we're going to entire do a whole transformation of Haven Park, park, park for the residents of the North Bronx and beyond. The people, the positive energy. 
That's 14-year-old Shamar Moore sharing why he likes Haven. Both he and 13-year-old Joshua Outram are on the same page with Councilmember King when it comes to changes needed. We should um, put more playgrounds for the kids to play in. Yeah. Fix um, the court, make the park cleaner. Add like a basketball center here, make the pool cleaner, stuff like that. Another suggestion was building changing tables for toddlers and infants. The process takes about two years, shared Councilmember King, who oversaw the gutting and rebuilding of this infrastructure here at St. Agnes. We were able to turn this capital project and turn this, turn this playground into a park and make it something with green space and trees and beautiful fiberglass basketball and, and a track and a soccer field, a, lawn, a, way, a workout station. All things that are transforming and growing this community, says Olin Old Timers Association member Peter Aguilar. It's great to see uh, uh, the community having a place that they'll be able to go and enjoy themselves and also it's great to see that the park has been maximized. You know, there's, it, you know it's, it's, there's a little bit of something for everyone. And soon that will include everyone at Haven Park. Anything you want to say to the city councilman? Uh, thank you. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. That's all for Bronx Updates. Switching gears, several candidates for Congress have emerged to represent District 15 after Congressman Jose Serrano finishes his term. And while it is early on in the political season with primary elections set in June of 2020, here at Bronx then we'd like to introduce the candidates for District 15 to our viewers. We've reached out to all who have officially entered this race and have spoken to candidates Jonathan Ortiz, Thomas Ramos, and Assemblyman Michael Blake. Joining us today to discuss District 15, his candidacy, and issues concerning the district, and more is Council Member Richie Torres. It's Welcome. An honor to be here. Thank you so much for joining he us here today. It's an honor to be here. Yes. So, um, you know what? I want to get straight to it with the issues that are passionate, um, that have struck you as something that needs to be done in the Bronx. And one of those issues is housing. And that yeah. seems to be the topic for most of the members who have joined the race. Tell us what sets you apart and what you are planning to do to improve housing. Well, I have been an advocate for affordable housing from the moment I entered public office. And not only have I studied the issues in depth, but I've lived, you know, I grew up in public housing right across the street from Trump Golf Course. Mm -hmm. yeah, that must Living be very interesting now interesting. to go back so, and see that. You know, I, I tell people I've been smelling the stench of Donald Trump well before oh, he became wow. president. But <laughs> I was living in conditions of mold and mildew and lead with no reliable heat and hot water. Mm -hmm. And right across the street, as I was living in those conditions, the city was spending more than $100 million on a golf course for Donald Trump. And I remember asking myself at the time, how could it be that we're investing more in a gilded, gated golf course for Donald Trump than in the homes of struggling New Yorkers. And so that's what inspired me first to be a housing organizer mm -hmm. and then run for the city council. And for six years, I've been the leading advocate for public housing in the city of New York. The South Bronx, which is said to be the poorest in the country, has one of the largest concentrations of public housing, which has been so savagely starved of funding at every level of government that it has $32 billion worth of capital needs you know, in the pri private housing sector, you have more than half the residents in a neighborhood like Fordham pay more than half their income toward their rent. And that's before you factor in the cost of health care, prescription drugs, food, transportation. So for everyday New Yorkers, our city is becoming increasingly unlivable. You know, we've heard about the term, the working poor, we now have the working homeless, mm -hmm. right? Half of the people in our shelter system are working people, right? The promise of the American dream is that if you abide by the law and you play by the rules, you will have a fighting chance at a decent life. That is no longer true. And so we need a member of Congress who's going to restore the promise of the American dream. So what do you think is happening? Because housing has been an ongoing problem for years. Homelessness, even though yeah. the numbers seem to be going down, it's still a big issue. What do you think is causing all these issues and why haven't they been tackled yet? And the fact is the federal government has left behind the people in the South Bronx, right? Most of the programs uh, affecting housing, whether it's Section 8 or Section 9 public housing or the low-income housing tax credit, are all federal in nature. And so we need to create programs like a tax credit that brings relief to families that pay more than 30 percent of their income toward their rent. There are families who are living on the edge of homelessness because they can no longer afford to pay their rent. Right? Incomes are stagnating and the rent is, is rising. And I see a bee here. <laughs> I was trying not to. <laughs> Trying to sweeten up your comments yeah. here. I was trying not it's to. It's divine intervention. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, go about pushing that tax credit to make sure that it passes? 
Look, the most important thing to know is the rules are set in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the core issues in the district are health and housing, and most of the policies affecting health and housing are set in Washington, D.C. And so if you want to have an impact in fighting racially concentrated poverty, if you want to have an impact in lifting the lives of working people, you have to be a policymaker in Washington, D.C., because that's where the rules are set. Mm -hmm. Now, one of your other uh, goals is to make sure that the Bronx is safe, yeah. especially for our youth, for our families. Yeah. And I'm sure that you're, when you're out in the field that you're able to connect with those people who, are, who may say, you know what, I don't think my vote matters. But how are you ensuring them that, yes, their vote is going to matter and that a difference can be made? Look, it's not often that you have an open congressional primary. There's an opportunity to elect the next generation of leadership in the Bronx to have the voters of the Bronx see themselves reflected in their elected officials in Washington, D.C. And I just tell people, if we do nothing, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. right? We have to agitate for change. That's the best hope for achieving transformational change in our country. Now talk about some of the changes that you've made. Sure, so I have been in the investigations chair for about two years. I have actually fought Donald Trump here in New York City. So we conducted an investigation into Kushner companies, the son-in-law of Donald Trump, who was using illegal construction to harass tenants out of their homes and drive affordable housing units out of existence. And we were able to pass a law that closes the Kushner loopholes, that requires the Department of Buildings to refer landlords like Jared Kushner to the DA's Office for Criminal Prosecution. So if you are weaponizing illegal construction to harass people out of their homes, you can be subject to criminal prosecution because of the law that I passed. I've also had a role in securing billions of dollars in new funding for public housing. So I was, I'm the support of a program that led to $500 million in renovation in a public housing development in Southeast Queens, as well as in the Bronx. So I've been a leader on affordable housing in the city. And what about um, when it comes to public schooling, when it comes to public hospitals? Um, these are also issues that you are trying to make sure yeah. that our people are getting the most yeah. out of everything that they can in their community. So we need to ensure that public hospitals like Jacoby and Lincoln Hospital receive their fair share of safety net funding. But we also have to ensure that every New Yorker has access to affordable, quality health care. I'm in favor of creating a public option. Medicare should be available to every New Yorker. Right? You should have the ability to choose which insurance you prefer mm -hmm. because that would restore choice and competition in the marketplace. So you know, health care should be the highest priority. It's a fourth of the Bronx economy, the largest employer in the Bronx is Montefiore, the largest unionized workforce in the Bronx is 1199. So healthcare is certainly going to be at the center of my platform. Well, what's the lasting message that you'd like to give to our viewers who are watching here today? Why they should go ahead and vote for Richie Torres? Look, the, this is going to be a change election. It's going to be a choice between the past and the future, between a reactionary old guard and a new generation of leadership. And I suspect the voters feel, as, as Albert Einstein did, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's the definition of insanity. And so we have to reject the status quo and elect a new generation of leadership. And there's no one who brings the best combination of change and experience more than I do. Excellent. Thank you so of much course. for your time. Good luck. Thank you. To find out more about Councilmember Richie Torres for Congress, visit torres.nyc. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Open right after this. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. 
Welcome back. The Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation is presenting Bronx Music at Melrose, a free live music event featuring Bronx artists, food, community resources, arts and crafts, including Bronx Sounds, Music and Poetry Festival, and more. Here to discuss the upcoming event is Yasmin Vega, Senior Program and Manager at Redco. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's for so great to see us. you. So nice to see you too. Bringing the sunshine into our studio. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate that beautiful day outside, beautiful day in here, beautiful people. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad it stopped raining. Yes. <laughs> and it won't be raining on Saturday either for it our event. Won't be. So let's talk about this great event. I was saying, I remember when the, what was it called? The Boogie Down Booth, Booth was at Melrose. And yes. me and my family will go there and we'll listen to all the songs that were playing. It was so much fun. So tell us about this festival that's coming up. Thank you so much for visiting the Boogie Down booth. Yeah. And this Bronx Music at Melrose Festival builds on the work that Wetco has been doing in the Melrose neighborhood for about 10 years now. And in the this Bronx. This <laughs> wants to be a part of the show so bad. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, the work that Wetco has been doing in the Bronx now for 27 years. And this festival is the, our fourth annual Bronx Music at Melrose. And what it does is that it provides a fun space for recreation for the community. <laughs> and it's all about bringing music and arts and I'm back sorry. into the community. It's okay. fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, back into the community. So we're going to have live music, poetry, arts and crafts, just a space, a green area for recreation in a neighborhood that really doesn't have access to that many safe, clean parks mm -hmm. for people to just hang out and have fun. And this is all about bringing the community together, meeting your neighbors, and seeing what other resources are available to you right yeah. in your neighborhood. That's right. And we get that all. It's our fourth annual one, and every year people tell us, oh, wow, I didn't know that these other organizations were in the neighborhood. Yeah. So we're excited. So how does it fit into your mission at Wedco? So Wedco was founded on the idea that people deserve healthy neighborhoods and healthy apartments to live in. And that's the work you've been doing for 27 years. And part of a healthy, thriving neighborhood is arts and culture, mm -hmm. especially here in the South Bronx. Yes. That is the home to, of course, we all know hip hop, that's but right. the uh, salsa and Irish step dance and Yiddish music. So it has just been a crib of, what is it called? It's called the crib, right? Like yeah. a crib of music. <laughs> And the birthplace of music right. and so many, and that's how we really incorporate arts and culture into all of Wetco's programming from our Head Start Center to our after school program to, of course, uh, the community development department's initiatives that involve the Boogie Down Booth, for yeah. example. So really arts and culture is an integral part of all the work that Wetco does. And what I love is that it's for the whole family. So it's like you go there, your kids could be putting on the headphones and they could be listening to the music. There's, you know, there's something for everyone to take part in, right? Yes, and we really, and we hear from the community. And last year in 2018, we actually did a survey of 469 community members in partnership with DreamYard, the DreamYard project. And DreamYard is also in the neighborhood. Yes, DreamYard yeah. is a few blocks away. Right. Um, and with the Department of Cultural Affairs, and what we, found, we, what we found is that community members told us, listen, the number two thing that they want the most, they want more outdoor events, they want more arts and culture, they want more places to engage. So we, we hear this and we listen to this, and that's why we bring these events out for everyone to enjoy. And it's we hear- It's so great for the summer. Yes, we're so People excited. We're always looking for something to do. So now I come up on Melrose, what am I expecting? What am I going to see? What is going to be happening throughout the whole day? Well, the event's this Saturday, July 27th, mm -hmm. from 3 to 9 p.m. at the Brequa College Outdoor Amphitheater at 890 Washington Avenue. what a Avenue. great space. It's such a great space, mm -hmm. and it's a perfect space for what we have going on all day. So from 3 to 9, we're going to have an all-day DJ, we're going to have arts and crafts, we're going to have games for the whole family, and starting at 5 p.m., we have this special portion that we call Bronx Sounds and Poetry, where we have local poets reading and uh, uh, music performances from the Bangladeshi Fine Arts Academy to, I have the whole list here, to <laughs> a magician, so and there's so much going on. And what's great is that the Brico College Amphitheater has this space for projection. So there's going to be projected images alongside with poems from Brico College poets. It's just a great space, and we're really looking forward to it. And you can come and say the whole three to nine, or you mm -hmm. can come for whenever you want. 
we'll have you. Please stop by. Please say hi. Please enjoy. We want to meet you. Now, we know what uh, WebCo does throughout the summer, but what do you do all year round for those who are not familiar with the program? Well, we do a lot. So I started mentioning we have our after-school programs. We have our Head Start Center. We have a home-based child care training micro-enterprise. Mm. So anyone who wants to start a business taking care of children in their home, we get them started and get them certified and everything. And year-round, we have events. Of course, you know, weather provide, uh, permitting, but we have a tree lighting in Melrose in the winter. And we definitely encourage people to stay in touch with us, go to our website, go on our Facebook. We always have things going on. I can't even begin to <laughs> think of everything. We always have year-round events happening in our neighborhoods. Now, the opening of the new Bronx Music Hall is coming up pretty quickly. It's yes. going to be in Melrose. Yes. What will the venue bring to the neighborhood? So we are so excited to open the Bronx Music Hall, which is going to be the permanent home of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. That also provides programming and events and concerts and everything you can imagine year-round as well. So it's going to be the permanent home, and it's going to be this 14,000 square foot performance and art. It looks like it's going to be beautiful. An exhibition space. Thank yeah. you so much. It really is a lot of work and, and thought and community input and what we've been hearing for years has gone into the space and what we want to see and we're opening this cultural space because of what we've heard and it'll be open spring 2020 our, our new building which is where the Bronx Music Hall is going to be located will open this fall Bronx Commons and spring 2020 we'll be back to tell you about the brand the grand opening of the Bronx Music Hall but we are so excited to be able to have this place for the community to really delve deeper into yeah. the arts and the culture. Excellent. Well, we are so excited and we'll be there to cover every point, every opening that you all are having. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. We'll for let being you here. know. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much. Thank you. Bronx Music at Melrose will be taking place on Saturday, July 27th from 3 to 9 p.m. at Boricua College's Outdoor Amphitheater located at 890 Washington Avenue. Visit redco.org or call 718-839-1129 for more information. Stay tuned for more Open after this. Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Talking about inspirational quotes. You gotta believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise, Louise, can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at getschool.com. Thank you for staying with us. The Physician Assistant Program at Mercy College is a full-time program embodying the principles of primary care medicine, helping graduates obtain positions in a wide range of medical specialties. BronxNet correspondent Jericho Tran was able to chat with the Physician Assistant Program Director over at Mercy College. Let's check it out. The Physician Assistant Studies Program at Mercy College started in 2001. They currently have about 120 students where graduates found opportunities in outpatient medicine, orthopedic surgery, OBGYN, and other fields. The program is widely known for its community outreach, which complies with their mission statement to provide quality, cost-effective, accessible health care, especially to underserved patients in the tri-state area. Here to tell us more are Program Director Professor Lorraine Cashin and students Gabriella Corona and Marco Loncar. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Lorraine, you started, uh, you actually graduated with the first physician assistant program at Mercy College in 2001, and I now did. you are the program director. Walk me through yes. that journey. Thank you, thank you. It's been a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> walk me through what that's oh, been like for you. Walk me through the journey. Okay, so um, I graduated with the first class, as she said. <clears throat> I went into emergency medicine in an underserved area. I then came back to the college and was asked to be the program director, and what I did bring with me, which was a point of negotiation, was to bring my international medicine with me. And we also wrote for a grant so that we could get a mobile health vehicle and we received the grant um, and do a lot of community outreach on a mobile health vehicle and um, go out to the various communities here in the Bronx. And Gabrielle, you're in your third year. Walk me through some of the community outreach that you've been through throughout your years with the program. Oh, there's been so many. <laughs> um, a lot of them are throughout the Bronx. Um, we do a lot of health 
care screening such as blood pressure checks, um, sugar checks, and if something's not up to par, we educate the patients and then send them to their primary care physician. If they don't have one, then we make sure we provide them a list that they can um, follow up with. Um, I also was able to go to um, Africa to um, different regions, um, Gambia and Senegal, and we were also able to provide um, health care there. Walk me through what that experience was like for you. That's um, a lot. Life changing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't, I don't think you could put it into words until you actually experience it yourself. Um, we, something that really moved me there was just the fact that I was able to educate children and um, parents on just the simple measures of cleaning a wound because they thought they should never clean a wound. Um, so we were able to educate them and other than providing them health care and even like giving them vitamins, that was just such a big thing for them and it was really moving to me and I would love to stay in the underserved community. And Marco, you're in your first year. What are your some of your expectations coming into the program? Uh, some of my expectations are not have any free time anymore. Um, <laughs> constantly studying, um, you know, just trying to learn as much information as I can so I could be the best provider that I could be when I graduate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a, a lot of time management um, and just working together as a team, as a class, to uh, get through the material and kind of divide it up because it's impossible to get through everything on your own. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important thing is to work as a team and. Uh, and get through the material as best as possible. And do you know what field you want to go into? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I've always been an athlete um, and a runner, so my first in, like, initial thought was orthopedics. Um, but you know, going on the medical missions and being on the mobile health vehicle, I think might change my mind um, and want to stick to primary care, um, just because that's such a big need now. Um, so we'll see. Um, and. What would you, what do you think that students going into the program, like Marco, should know about the program, you know, throughout their years there? Um, well, one of the reasons I picked this program was because of the mission statement, and when I came into the interview, it was just so welcoming. Um, I remember Professor Cash <laughs> specifically I asked her so many questions, but I felt like I connected with her, and I felt like anybody that I spoke to was able to help me, and I felt like it was just... Um, such a close community just within the program and so like he said you do have to stick like a team to make sure that you could be able to get through the material and I felt like that was best here um, and time management is the best thing you can do and ask as many questions as you can um, nothing's ever <laughs> nothing I, I don't know how to explain there like, are no stupid questions basically <laughs> <laughs> and professor Cashin what should students know about the physician's assistant program um, that it is, I think, um, probably as much as we tell them it's difficult, it's even more difficult, and I think that the students will attest to that. I think that it's a great field to go into. I think it's a very flexible and versatile field. I think that it is in great, there, the healthcare industry is booming, and I think as a physician assistant, there are so many job opportunities. Um, and I think that, you know, no, the program itself, I think that we have a great program. I think that Mercy College is a great college and it embraces our program and helps our program to grow stronger and to help, help our program succeed. And what have you done um, while you were program director that you are proud of uh, for the physician assistant program? Brought the international. <laughs> I think really, um, because I go with the students on every international medical mission. I think that's one. I think another thing, I, I revamped the whole curriculum when I came in as the director to make it more current, mm -hmm. you know, so that the currency was, was more in line with what's happening out there in medicine. Um, and we try to continue doing it. It's a continuous effort of the whole team. And so it's not necessarily just me. It's the whole team. It's, again, like they say, it's a team effort with students. We have team effort with the faculty. Um, so I think, and it's the community. It was getting the mobile health vehicle and getting out there and just reaching out and making partnerships with Head Start and Westchester Square and just making partnerships. And um, Gabriella, you're currently, I heard, working on your thesis. Can you tell us a little bit about it, please? 
Sure. So um, during our third year, third year, we work in a group with Dr. Baker, and he um, lets us make a proposal on a um, study. Um, so before this, we had a different project, and we studied um, to see if cannabis was a good alternative for um, opioids and, and treating patients with chronic pain. Um, and now our proposal is basically trying to see if there's a uh, difference in efficacy depending on how you um, take the cannabis, whether it be topical, um, inhaled, or ingested. And Marco, when you were deciding whether or not to go to Mercy College, um, and participate with the program. Mm -hmm. What did you see that excited you? Uh, well, I wanted to add, as uh, Professor Cashin was saying, I think the international and local outreach was a big factor in uh, my decision to go to Mercy. And I think for the rest of my classmates, it was as well. Um, I researched a lot of programs, and I found that not a lot had a lot to do with outreach and international missions. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we started out as a primary care profession, so I think that uh, that was a big decision why I chose to, to pick Mercy. Professor Lorraine, when deciding where to go internationally, how do you make that decision? I actually um, let the class make that decision. Oh, okay. So how do you guys decide? Uh, I think as a class we just you know vote on different locations and whatever location wins, we, uh, we decide to start planning that trip around that location. All right, is there anything else that you guys want to add? Um, I just think that Mercy is a great program and we're affiliated with a lot of hospitals and not just hospitals but also private practices. Um, some of the hospitals that um, some of our students and myself um, rotate through are like Montefiore, Westchester Medical Center, NYP. Um, there's millions almost <laughs> but there's plenty and a lot of um, different um, private um, pra practices and I think that's great. Um, seeing the variety of patients throughout the community. Yeah, I think uh, just the location of the program. Um, you're in New York City, you're gonna see so many different patient populations that you get exposed to lots of different things. So just for experience, I think it's amazing. I'll add one thing that <laughs> Gabby has already secured a job, her dream job. Yeah. Your dream job? Yeah. Congratulations. Tell me a little bit about it. Um, so I actually live in Connecticut and I'll be working in Connecticut at Danbury Hospital. Um, I'll be a nocturnist um, hospitalist full time. <laughs> Can you let the audience know what that is? Uh, so, okay, so as um, it's internal medicine. Mm -hmm. So I'll be rounding throughout the hospital seeing patients that need to be admitted into the hospital and taking care of them. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for being with us today. For thank more you. information about the Mercy College Physician Assistant Studies Program, you can visit www.mercy.edu. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jericho Tran at BronxNet at Mercy Studios. We'll be right back with more Open right after this. <music> Welcome back. The League of Women Voters is an activist grassroots organization that believes voters should play a, a critical role in democracy. They're holding an upcoming training workshop to discuss some recent changes regarding voters' registration. Joining us now with more information are Fanny Connor, Patricia Manning, and Jerry Russo from the League of Women Voters. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you so much for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you, you for having, having us. us. So we just want to get into the history first about the League of Women Voters. It's such a great organization that's been around for 
uh, for years, for well, 72, is it? 100. Oh, 100. 100. I was yes. 25 years, but well, 100 <laughs> years. So let's talk about the League of Women Voters and how it has played a crucial role in our society. Well, as an organization, we are a national organization, open to both men and women. Uh, we have, our purpose is to encourage informed, active participation in government. Uh, and we provide a number of different services and opportunities for uh, members to enhance their, their knowledge. Uh, and we provide many services uh, for, uh, for the community and voters in Slauch. Uh, so we provide, mono we provide, uh, we provide, mo I can't say it today. Um, we do voter registration training. Mm -hmm. We do debate. We do, uh, we have study groups. Uh, we studied various topics uh, such as healthcare and immigration and various other items of interest. Uh, we provide students an opportunity to go to Albany to uh, do uh, so that they can see how government actually works and each year we send w one or two members from New York City and the other leagues throughout the state uh, send members and they stay for about uh, two and a half days. To uh, really get a hands-on on, um, approach as to what's going on in our government. That, that's, yes. That's and th that leads us to the voter registration training workshop, which I think is so timely, especially now we're just talking to uh, Council Member Richie Torres, and we've been talking to all of the, um, everyone who's thrown their hat into this race for um, Congress. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about the voter registration training workshop and what you're offering to uh, Ron Tice. So, um, I'm so happy to be here today, happy, especially happy in to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. The Bronx needs to um, be a little bit more educated in knowing how to register voters, how to run their own voting registration drives. This year in particular is so important because um, there are lots of changes that are coming about with just voter registration. 17-year-olds uh, can now pre-register. Yeah. Um, there are changes in the law as far as for New York State. If you move out of, let's say, the Bronx, New York, you move to um, any county upstate, anywhere else in New York, you don't have to uh, register again. So uh, we are And that was something that needed to be done before? Because I knew state to state, but if you move from the, uh, where? If you move within the state, there's no need to re-register. That's great. Because so, I think that also turned away a lot of people because they're like, oh, it's so much paperwork. I don't want to have to go through this mm -hmm. again, you know? So, so it's one time, that's it. That's it. That's, that's it. Great. You just have to notify the post office mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, you've changed your address. Um, so we're having what's really it's like a boot camp. So it's not just for new recruits to come in and learn how to register. It's also for uh, our trained group of people to come back and get the updates. So in starting off, we're starting in the Bronx first. That's great. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be holding a voters uh, training registration. Um, it's August 1st, Thursday, August 1st. Won't take a lot of your time. It's from 6 o'clock to 7.30. And it's going to be hosted at Dominicano's USA office at 369 East 149th Street, 11th, uh, 11th uh, Suite 11, excuse me. So right at the hub, right at the third avenue. Right at the hub, exactly. And uh, we're encouraging everyone to come. As a matter of fact, we're going to be giving something very important and very um, exciting. As you know, we are celebrating our 100th year um, anniversary and uh, this is a commemorative button. Now, who doesn't love buttons? This is a commemorative <laughs> button. So the first 20 people to register will receive this, plus we have a surprise gift. Oh. So. And you can't give me um, a hint as to what that is? You can't give me <laughs> a hint? No <laughs> hints. You all have to show up. <laughs> so, um, you know, by doing this training, you will be able to 
as I said, you know, run your own drives. You'll be able to train. You'll be able to work with the League of Women Voters at their tabling events. So this is a very exciting time for us. And, you know, um, you were just saying, you know, we were just saying before we went, uh, came back from our break how important this was because you work along with the congressmen and the assemblymen and everyone who are, are our politicians to make sure that they're also letting their people know that it's important to vote and that we have the power to get changes made in our community, as we were saying earlier. Right. And that's um, actually the league is nonpartisan, so our goal really is just to get people involved and educated. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the questions that, that we often hear is, or, or we'll, you know, we'll be saying, you know, are you registered to vote? No, it's, it, it, my vote doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. not important. We hear that a lot. And, uh, and particularly, or people will get out and vote for the president every right. four years. But as Mr. Torres said earlier, the city, I mean, our council members really run the city. Okay. And all of the decisions that are made and all of the, the benefits that we uh, uh, want to achieve uh, come from our council members. And if you don't vote there, you know, you're giving somebody else the power to run your community. So it, start, it starts local. It starts absolutely, absolutely locally. And, um, uh, and I... I I, I think Mr. Torres, you know, was like on target. He's he's only allowed to do eight years, which is kind of sad because he's quite good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> so, no, no. And but uh, you know, so um, if someone else is going to be coming in. We need to know who's going to be running the neighborhood after that. And I think what we've seen from all of our um, members, assemblymen, and everybody who are for the Bronx is that we see that they have a passion for the Bronx. Right. Everyone, every one of our uh, politicians who have been on this show um, talking about, you know, what they want to see, the changes they want to see. One thing that I've seen that's in common is that they have a love for the Bronx and that they want to see change happen. And that's what I see coming from you ladies as well. So just want to say thank you thank uh, for you. being here today. And I hope that everyone will go out and be a part of this voters registration workshop and also get a button. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. First 20, remember. The voter registration training workshop will be taking place on Thursday, August 1st from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at Dominicanos, USA, located at 369 East 149th Street, Suite 11 in the Bronx. For more information, visit lwv.org or call 212-725-3541. Don't go anywhere. More open after this. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. Welcome back. Our next guest is the 2019 Mother of the Year for the state of New York. She's changed the face of financial literacy through writing and implementing a finance curriculum in hundreds of schools nationwide. We welcome award-winning author and founder of Kids Who Bank and Kipreneur Awards Gala, Jitali Bellington. 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, you are definitely a mom who's making it work. Man, I love mompreneur. It. I'm just, <laughs> I'm excited to be in this space and part of that sorority of motherhood. Yes, yes. And we, I, I love it. I love seeing a mom who is able to share her gifts with everyone and who's like openly like just sh showing us your passion. So let's talk about Kids Who Bank. What is it and how are you changing the face of financial literacy? So Kids Who Bank started off as a youth financial literacy initiative, which was just really about wanting to have our youth make better and um, sound decisions when it comes to their relationship with money and the finances period compared to a lot of us adults, right? And then as we started to go into the school systems, we actually realized a lot of adults were really struggling with it. And although I thought there were a lot of adult programs mm -hmm. or programs catering to adults, I realized that a lot of them didn't really teach it from the simplicity um, of the child's view, right? Yeah. Which a lot of us sometimes need, right? We still need it. I know so, I needed it. Right? So it's interesting because someone called uh, Kids Who Bank, you know, Finance for Dummies, right? Like <laughs> our own version of Finance for Dummies. Yeah. And I was just like, I wouldn't use that word, but, <laughs> um, you know, but it really started with one child going home with our APR and compound interest sheet. And then when they went home with it, the, the mom was like, called me up and said, this is the first time I ever understood APRs and compound interest and what it meant to have a 24% APR. And I think that's what's making it great is that you're simplifying it, not just for the kids, but we need it simplified as well. Yes. Because I didn't know anything about APR when I was getting my first credit card in college. I had no idea what it was about. And we're still seeing those same issues years later, right? So this year we did 15 colleges. And when we went into those colleges, a lot of the sophomores already had debt from their first year of college, receiving a card as a freshman, mm -hmm. not knowing that their high APR would equate if they're making minimum payments, X, Y, and Z. And so then they would say, oh, I know, I'm making my minimum payments. And then we would come in and we're elab we elaborate and we go, minimum payments, at the end of it, you're basically doubling what you're paying the company. Right. So instead of 5000 back, you're paying them maybe $10,000, $9,000 back. Money that could have went into a mutual fund or money, you know, savings, savings account. Savings or purchasing something that you actually do want right. to purchase. Um, you know, so it's really just rewiring our brain um, when it comes to our discussions when it comes around finance. So let's talk about this wonderful book that you have here. Yes. I love the cover. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Once Versus Needs was the first, was actually the catalyst of it all. When I left the corporate world after 13 and a half years, um, because I became a mother, I wanted to be a hands-on mom. And I wrote this book. That was my first step. And then someone read the book and said, you should turn this into a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then before I knew it, we were going into our first 137 schools. That's and then year two, which was this year, we did 217 schools nationwide, wow. plus the UK. Um, and a class in Australia, and the list continues, and we're just growing. Um, but it's been really exciting, and the book really tackles concepts like depreciation, for instance. Um, you know, in the story, the little boy has a game console, and when he goes to sell it so he can make money to buy a new toy, he realizes that the game console no longer is worth the money that he right. purchased it for, or his parents purchased it for. And it's just really teaching these lessons in a fun, story-formatted way so that kids aren't bored and don't feel like it's a dictionary book. Right. They just learn the lessons without even realizing it's kind of like osmosis, right? And it's giving them the value of money. I mean, kids will come to you, you know, oh, I want this new PlayStation. I want this new thing. I want it, I want it, I want it. And they have no idea, first of all, the amount of money that's going into it. And mm -hmm. like you said, how the value diminishes year after to year and you know and some people go well you know Atari and certain games have gone back up in price right. but how long did you have to wait and yeah. how many people actually still have an Atari for instance That's and I'm true. showing my age right now but <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> you know okay. some of the things that we have um, yeah. we take for granted right? so, so even true. like sneakers some kids will say Jordans um, you know I'm like, well, how much did it cost to make the sneaker? Mm -hmm. And did you make a profit off of it? Did you maybe flip it and double it and then use the profit to purchase it? Yeah. It's not about telling the kid not to have a lavish sneaker or a product that they like that they spent a lot of money on. It's really more about rewiring what they invest their money in, when they invest it, and how do they invest it. Well, another thing that you have done is the trademark of this shirt. Money yes. is not my God, which I love, by the way. Thank I love you. the shirt. Thank you. Yes. So. Money is not my God came about because when I left the corporate world, a lot of people were like, you're making six figures, you're crazy, you're really leaving. And I was just like, yes, because I want to be a hands-on mother. And they were like, you're giving all of that up to be a mom? And I'm like, 
what kind of response is that? <laughs> and, you know, some people, they don't find it hard, to, you know, after three months to just go back to work. Right. But me, I found it excruciatingly yeah, hard. Yeah, no, it is difficult. And, you know, I went back for about a month and a half, and I missed his first giggle, and I was depressed. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I missed his giggle. Right. You know, who knows if that was they partially so the, fast, the yeah. mom hormones or what, yeah. but I just knew that it was time for me to do something different. And I would always tell people, money is not my God. That's how I was able to walk away from the money. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just always my defining, a defining point for me is just that my priority isn't the money first. You know, my family, God, that's you know, right. those, that's number one not in my only, life. Yeah, no, definitely. I have the same goals. God, family, everything else is going to come in order. I love it. Fully agree. Yeah. So let's talk about, real quick, the outreach in Ghana. That is where my family is from. So I'm very excited about that. So I'm mixed with Cape Verdean, so that's so what's yes. African love. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what happened is two of my partners are Ghanaian. One of them has one travel club, Aaron, uh, shout out to him. And then other one, Kristen, her daughter, Myla, is a celebrity um, Ghanaian, local Ghanaian ce celebrity model who's done Grace's, you know, Ralph Lauren and all these major ad campaigns. And, you know, we wanted to do originally a Youth Fun and Learn Day in Ghana. And then it came to our attention when I was researching, like, you know, fun things to do with my son because he's going to come to Ghana with me. Yeah. And I was like, where are the fun activities? Like, where are the children's museums or the, the fun centers or the playgrounds and amusement parks? And that led us to now wanting to create Ghana's first children's museum or youth center. I love it. And we're going to teach the youth things like e-commerce and beyond e-commerce, teach them as well financial literacy classes, uh, language classes, just anything to really help um, tourism and the locals as well to ensure that there is a fun day for everyone. I love it. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing the book, the shirt, and to showing us, you know, Thank what you. you have in store for us. We're really excited about Thank it. Thank you. And congratulations on being the New York State Mother of the Year. Thank you. Well Thank deserved. You. <laughs> All right. So I'm excited, and I hope to see you in Ghana this year. We'll right. To get you over there. I want to be there. All right. Brilliant. Oh, before I forget, oh, yes. this is for you. Oh. You Thank can keep you. it. Thank you so um, much. And then as sure. well, I just wanted to also say the title character in the book is Cape Verdean and Nigerian. Mm -hmm. So more West African love. I love But throughout it. the book, there's other cultures as well. So and I'll say he looks just like my son well. with all of his hair there leaning forward. Mine too. <laughs> my son has like the, the craziest fro. Every, in fact, when I braid his hair, people go like, where's Ozzy's fro? And I'm like, <laughs> Azikiwe's fro is tame today but normally he's just like shakes it and goes yes let them wear their crown as right? we said earlier exactly <laughs> for more information on jatali her initiatives and books visit kids .com. don't go anywhere more open after this see elephants hiding in trees because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Thank you for staying with us. Governor Andrew Cuomo has recently approved a new law making New York one of the first states in the nation to ban discrimination based on hair. Here to discuss the Hair Discrimination Act is Tremaine Wright, Assembly Member of District 56, and Jamal Bailey, Senator of District 36. Assemblymember Wright worked to pass this legislation, and Senator Baylor, Bailey is the senator sponsor. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. This is thank you. wonderful. I mean, when I read this, because I got the email last week, I said, you know what? First of all, I'm going to do this hairstyle for the <laughs> statement, because well, this humidity <laughs> was killing my hair, OK? <laughs> you know, they always make fun of me, and they say, you always come in with different hair. And I'm like, you know what? Because I need to do what works. But it's always a question when we want to put our hair in twists and braids. It's like, you know, how am I going to be looked at? But thank God Bronsnet is great with that. I've never had that problem. But it is. it has been a problem with women in corporate, with women in media. 
So um, I just want to congratulate you both, first of all, on getting this law passed. And I just want to get into it and just talk about what the law means now for men and women going forward with natural hair. Well, I would say we've expanded the definition of race. Mm -hmm. So essentially we've always had racial protections, not always, but we have racial protections in both our human rights law and our education law. Through this bill, we expanded the definition to capture natural hairstyles and hairstyles commonly associated with African, with your ethnic traits. So thereby we're capturing braids, knots, um, puffs, and things that, dreadlocks. Um, all of the hairstyles that are commonly associated with black people and that are oftentimes um, outside the scope of some of our um, narrowly uh, prescribed dress and or work t attire um, rules and regulations. Now, you've been on the forefront for this for many years. You've worn your hair natural for almost 17 years, yeah, right? Yeah, a little more than 17. Yeah, so this has been an, tell us how this has been an issue for you and well, how you have battled it. Similar to most women, when I got graduated from school, I had to determine how I was going to present myself in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer by training. I was mm -hmm. going to a, a law firm, and I was twisting one week. And by the end of the week, the twist looked different. Mm -hmm. You wear it out, the humidity affects <laughs> yes. it. One week I'm Especially pressing, I've weather. tried braids. Yeah. But as you said, the changes yeah. affected how I was perceived in my office, mm -hmm. and also, um, I would say it definitely affected the access that I had to work. Mm -hmm. And I finally determined that I was going to just create an image for myself that was this look, mm -hmm. and that's what it has been over the next last 17 years. And it's been working for you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, Senator Bailey, why did you decide to get involved? Why was this issue important for you? Uh, uh, well, someone on the right brought it to me, and it was a no-brainer. Certain things in, in, legislative, in our legislative careers, they have controversy. This was something that just made sense uh, mm -hmm. as the, the son and grandson of black women and the father of black daughters. Yeah. Uh, my, my daughters are that my inspiration for many things. Yeah. And thinking about them and how they like to wear their hair out, when they wear their hair out, my wife puts it out, and they, they call it their curlies, right? <laughs> and, and, and I would be saddened beyond belief if somebody decided one day that Giada and Karina, my daughter's names, that they could not work or they could be discriminated against in school or, or in a workplace simply because of the hair, the style that they choose to wear, having no bearing on their abilities, having no bearing on who they are as people. So people look at us as people of color. They look mm -hmm. at us as black people, specifically black women. Yeah. And they decide that this is a value judgment that I'm gonna make upon you the second I see you. I haven't spoken to you, I don't know you, but because you have your hair in a certain way, I'm gonna think this about you. And yeah. that's unacceptable, and that's, I'm, I'm glad Tremaine brought this to me, and I'm really excited that we have this in New York State now. I really am too, but do you think that it's actually gonna take effect right away? I mean, and you know what's crazy is that the natural hair freedom has been going on for quite uh, t some time now. You know, we, I feel like, you know, uh, some jobs are becoming more accepting of it, but like you said, some women are still going through it. I was surprised to see a statistic that said that 80% of women are still changing their hair, still putting chemicals in their hair just so that they fit in. So do you think now that this law has been passed that we're actually gonna start to see a change? It will be a slow change. We are not going to see a change overnight. This law gives people who are harmed a right of action. It's not going to change the behavior of your boss. But it will force them to remove any of the workplace policies. For example, a number of our um, delivery drivers are restricted from, and they're not allowed to have dreadlocks mm -hmm. because they claim that the hats don't fit over the dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. um, We've seen some MTA conversations recently because people who have to wrap their heads were asked to actually affix an MTA symbol to their turbans. So I think what we're going to see are for those in those spaces where they actually prescribe what we have to wear to work every day, mm -hmm. we're going to see immediate changes. But in the spaces where it's a little softer, it, it's left to a lot more discretion, what we're going to see is the opportunity for people to actually voice and bring in action against employers who have had an ongoing history of discriminating against and, and denying opportunity to people who wore their hair natural hairstyles. Well, we have to begin somewhere, and hopefully we'll be able to all wear our crowns yes. the way we want it.
Thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure. Really appreciate thank you. it. Absolutely. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum Channel 67, Verizon Files 33, or watch anytime on the web at bronsnet.org. That wraps it up for us here today in the set of Open. I'm Veronica Guiti. Make sure to keep this channel wide open, and remember, you should always let your light shine. Take care.